Well, I need you to do something today. I need you to open your hearts to God, which is a willful decision. Like you literally have to think in your mind and spirit, is there something in me that's closed off right now? Or am I fully able to hear from God and to sit there and just for a moment say, God, I'm opening myself to you. I walked in today with maybe hurts, habits, hangups, wounds, whatever, especially as it relates to marriage, and just for a moment say, God, all right, I'm going to set all that aside and open my heart to you. Because some of what we're going to talk today is touchy-feely, more touchy than feely. Like it, it will stir up some stuff in you, and you have to be willing to say, God, I believe you're stirring it up because you want to do a work in me, and I need you also to open your heart to me. Because some of the stuff I'm going to talk about, I don't want you to throw arrows at me later. I just want you to say, God, I believe you brought me here because you're for me and you're for my marriage and you're for the family that's within my marriage. I hope today is a help and a blessing. Today we're talking about healthy relationships and I'm going to focus on marriage. But remember, maybe you weren't here. A few weeks ago I said, if you're single, please still come on the days we talk about marriage. And when we talk about singleness in a few weeks, please, if you're married, still come. Why? As I said then, I'll say again now. Doctors don't go to school simply to learn what they're gonna be ailing on. Like, hey, I think later on in my life I'm gonna have kidney disease, so I'm just gonna study kidneys, forget the rest of the body. Doctors go and learn it all so that they can help all. So if you're single, learn what it means to be married. If you're married, learn what it means to be single because there's people in your midst who need the loving touch of God. If you agree, say yes. Amen. Glory to God. I want to ask the question today, if there's a design to marriage that makes all marriages work, and when I say all, I mean all, that there's not one marriage that would be excluded, and we have thousands, billions of different combinations of marriages. Some of you are high school sweethearts. Some of you met in a maybe uh, secular way, you're like at the bar, totally drunk, and you met, maybe, maybe it's match.com. No telling how the two of you got together, but here you are today, and I'm wondering, all shapes and sizes of marriages, all lengths of marriages, maybe it's your third marriage, whatever the case may be, is there a design, one singular design that works for all those marriages? (laughs) Well, there's the answer. (laughs) The answer is yes. It's found in Genesis 1.28. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. Our ushers will be glad to bring you a Bible, or you can open up your smartphone and check it out. There's four words that give us the design of marriage found in Genesis chapter 1, the very first book in the Bible. Just get past the table of contents, open it up, and there it is, Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. Here are these four words. Be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and and multiply. We are focusing on family, really focusing on marriage. And look, if you're looking in Genesis chapter one, you'll see that God created everything and he created the man and the woman and he put the man and the woman together. And the very first words he speaks out of his mouth to this newly formed couple is this, be fruitful and multiply. In other words, from the very beginning, God wanted marriages to be close and to be intimate. And as a result of that, for fruit to pour forth from their lives. And yes, It does include children, but that doesn't mean that if you're married and don't have any children that your life is not according to the design of God. I happen to know, and many of you ladies just met one such couple. If you were at the Women's Spring Retreat, you met Pastor Bernard and Liz Scott, two incredibly, powerfully faithful men and women and man of God, yet they have no children, but I promise you they're living out Genesis chapter 1, 28, because their life is fruitful, and they are multiplying their faith by the way that they live in marriage. Come on, were some of you ladies there? You remember Pastor Bernard and Liz? Will you agree with me? Whoop, 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 whoop. Yeah. Yep, you were more spicy a few weeks ago. You want to try again? Ladies, were you there? Whoa. <laughs> Sorry, I asked. This idea of being fruitful and multiplying is not just an idea. It's not a guy like, hmm, maybe this will work. This is God's purposeful plan for marriages, that we would be fruitful and multiply, which requires us to be intimate and close. If we don't, it affects everything. It affects everything. Look, just look at the family. When the marriage fails, the family starts to fail. And these are some of the symptoms you see on the earth today. Bullying, social media, brokenness, violence, and sex are rampant. There's purity issues, obesity, anxiety, depression. And I'm just talking about what's happening in our kids. 
And that happens when the marriage starts to dissolve and then the family starts to dissolve because we are not applying the principle of God's design to marriage to our own marriages. I've recently heard two of my favorite pastors say the same thing separate from one another. One's famous and one you've never heard of. And because they both said it, and I knew I was preaching marriage, I'm like, God, are you wanting me to repeat this? So I'm going to repeat it. Here's something I've heard that I'm going to share with you. If you're ready, say, I'm ready. Amen. Healthy marriages will make for healthy families. And healthy families will make for a healthy church family. And a healthy church family will make, a bunch of healthy church families will make for a healthy community. And a healthy community will make for a healthy, strong, great city. And that strong, healthy, great city will uh, combine with other great cities and make for a strong, great state. And a bunch of strong, healthy, great states make for a strong, great nation. Are you following me? And a great, strong, healthy nation makes for an incredibly strong and healthy world. So, if you want a great and healthy world, then we got to have a great and healthy nation, and great and healthy nations got to have great and healthy states, and those great strong states need great cities, and those cities need to be full of strong communities, and those communities need to be full of strong, healthy churches, and those strong, healthy churches have to have strong, healthy families, which only happen if we have strong, healthy marriages. So here's what I'm saying. Don't underestimate your role in this world as a husband or as a wife, because everything hinges on us depending on this word of God to be fruitful and to multiply, for our marriage to be fruitful and multiplying. Don't underestimate your power, both in the home family and in your church family. Here's what Ephesians 5 says. You don't need to turn there. I'm just going to summarize. Ephesians 5 says, husbands, lay down your lives for your wives as Christ did for the church. Then he says to the wives, wives, submit to your husbands. Both of these are pictures of Christ's sacrifice for all. He was both submissive to his father and he laid down his life for us, the church. As a result, the enemy hates marriage because it's a picture of Christ's sacrifice. And so marriage is under attack. If you agree with that, say, yup. But it's not new. It's not because the Supreme Court changed some rules just a few years ago. Marriage has been under attack since the very beginning. In Genesis chapter three, you have the husband and the wife living together in the cool of the evening with God the Father. It's a picture of the triune God. God the Father there in the garden, God the Son, Jesus, represented by the husband, and then the Holy Spirit represented by the wife who's the helper, the advocate. I mean, all of this is there. It's this perfect picture of the triune God in the garden. And it's supposed to be a perfect picture of God still today a husband and a wife and the Lord living in harmony so that the whole earth can be knowing of this Jesus Christ through our fruitfulness and our multiplication. But if you look at Genesis chapter three in your Bible, you see the heading, it says the fall of man. Pastor Jimmy Evans, who's one of the foremost minds and communicators, he and his wife about marriage on the earth today, says that Genesis chapter three is not the fall of man, it's the fall of marriage. Because the enemy comes in and his little serpent-like self and he says lies to the wife. The husband who's supposed to be covering her sits on the sidelines, doesn't say anything. The two of them imbibe together, eat of the fruit that they should not. And this whole relationship between them and God the Father is broken to pieces. This perfect marriage, the three in one, husband, wife, and holy God is disrupted there in Genesis chapter three because the enemy does not want marriages to look like God. He wants marriages to look like what you see mostly in our society today, broken, frail, uh, abuse, wh whatever the case may be, all the stuff that you hear about marriages, that's what the enemy wants. He does not want the healthy, vibrant, life-giving, fruitful, and multiplying marriages. Genesis chapter 2 gives us a picture of what great marriage looks like. It says this, that is why a man, a man, leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, a woman, and they become one flesh. One plus one equals one. Verse 25, it says, Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. This is a picture of perfect marriage. And I want to show you what it looks like. So 20 years ago, almost, my wife walked the aisle. Today, she's going to walk the stage. Would you welcome my wife, Christine Ingram? Here comes the bride. <laughs> da, 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 da. So let's just put this down here a second. And uh, this is a picture. Hi. 
really close of marriage as God intended it. Very close, very intimate, very passionate, something burning white hot within us. And it's like this for the most part on the wedding day. Woo! Like that. I'm sorry, just did I hurt you? I squeezed really hard. <laughs> It's like this, like she just walked down the aisle and we're standing here before God and we're getting married and then the rest of the night continues and the honeymoon stuff happens and all of that is closeness and intimacy and love. And it's a picture that God gives us at the beginning, like we are both together, naked and no shame. We're going to talk about that more in just a minute, but it starts like this. It's called passion. And when you hear the word passion, I don't want you to think just physical intimacy, I'm literally talking about that burning in your heart for your spouse that is there at some point. There's that spark. And if that spark is gone, that's why we're gathered together today. If that spark is there, then we're gathered today to blow wind on it, that it will burst even furthermore in the flame. But it looks like this at the beginning, super close, right here together. But this is what happens to most marriages. Squabble, fight, debt. Kids, not kids aren't the enemy, but when you exalt kids over your marriage, stuff starts to happen. And so then you're married, and that closeness, that intimacy that makes you able to be fruitful and multiply becomes increasingly more difficult because you're living like this. Hey, honey, how you doing? And literally, I mean, maybe, you, maybe your marriage is, is like this right now, and we don't mean to poke fun. But this happens as distance and woundings and all sorts of stuff comes between us. We grow further and further apart, but God wants us to be one. Come here, my love. To be this close is the idea, to have passion between us. And we're going to talk about how to find that passion today. But before we do, I'd say there's two major goals that we're going to talk about. Christine's going to talk about one. I'm going to talk about one. And the idea is for both of those goals to help us to achieve this closeness again. That that wedding day, that honeymoon experience in all of its wonder could be restored to you fully. And this is the good news of today. God's job description is to be a reconciler. Like if you were to look, it's right there in the bullet points. It says, I am a reconciler, which means I take broken relationships and I bring them back into alignment. That's what God does. First, between us and him through the blood of Jesus Christ. But did you know that the cross also includes reconciling us one to another? so that we can be back in this place of alignment. This is fun for me, I don't know about (laughs) y'all. I wanna read to you Ephesians chapter two. It's not gonna be on the screen, you don't need to turn there, I just wanna read this to you. Therefore, remember that that formerly, you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised, so you've got a a name, by those who call themselves the uncircumcisions, uh, uncircumcision, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God and the world. You're like, what did you just read? You lost me at the beginning. Essentially, there's one group called the circumcised, and there's one group called the uncircumcised, and they both got names, and they both are separated. There's lots of animosity and hatred. They're not allowed. You're separate from us. We're the special people. You're the unspecial people. All of this is going on for generations. And generations. Verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And verse 14, for he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. And in essence, what I want you to see is this, that if God can take thousands of years of hatred between two people groups, then he can take your one or 10, or 20, or 50 years of issues between you and your spouse, and he can divide, um, excuse me, he can destroy the dividing wall of hostility in your marriage and bring you back to perfect unity with your spouse. And listen, you may be sitting here thinking internally, I don't enjoy my spouse anymore. I, I don't enjoy her presence or his presence I've gotten to the place where I'm just kind of, I don't see any hope in it. And here, I just want to declare this over you. There is hope for your marriage that one day, that which you felt at the beginning, you will feel again if you begin to apply the design that he has for you in your marriage. It says he is our peace. He will do the work. And you'll see miracles unfold. And though you've been far from each other, this picture of you and your spouse together can happen again. It can start today. It can start today. Amen? Amen. 
Were you going to reread Ephesians? I forgot. <laughs> Ephesians 2.14. Before we go any further, we have to go back to what it is God <laughs> wants to do in and through us this morning. What he wants to do ultimately is give us hope which is what Tim's been talking about. Where does that hope come from? Because just like with us in God, when there was a barrier of sin or something that kept that relationship apart, that's the barrier that we're talking about. So Ephesians 2.14 says, this is what we stand on. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Amen. So if there's a barrier... What, what kind of barrier are we talking about? Tim mentioned there's two points. There's two characteristics of an intimate and a design to win marriage that God wants to highlight to us today. And the first characteristic that we need, it's purity. Now, purity might conjure up all kinds of things, but what we're talking about right now is purity that allows a closeness so we can be near each other. There's no sin. There's no brokenness. There's no wounding between us. So purity is when we purposefully choose to remain close by eliminating all the barriers. We don't have time to talk about all the possible barriers this morning. We're going to focus on one particular area, but I'm sure you could think of a million things. Our schedules become barriers. Our busyness becomes barriers. The way our bodies change after years go by becomes a barrier. The way we treat each other becomes a barrier. If we prioritize work or we prioritize health even, if we prioritize our kids over our marriage, then all of a sudden we've got this distance between us. But what we're going to focus on this morning is the barrier of woundedness, the wounds that we inflict upon each other that places a distance between us. Because when we wound each other, just like when we disobey God, I put sin between us. And if there's sin between us, there cannot be purity. Mm -hmm. So if purity is purposely, purposefully choosing to remain close to my husband by eliminating all those barriers, then what can I do to deal with and eliminate the wounds that we cause one another? Now, wounds could be big. They could be they could be small. They could be, you told me you were going to be home at, at 6 for dinner, and I worked all day, and the kids are all ready, and you, you came home at 9. That could be a wound. It could be a wound of harsh words. It could be, boy, you sure don't look like what I married. I've he, never said that, by the way. No, he hasn't. <laughs> <laughs> Nor does he really come home at 9. But I'm just saying, in general, those are things that can happen, but they can, they can be all manner of things. And you know, the reality is that our interpretation of what's going on, that influences our woundedness, right? How hungry, how lonely, how tired, how angry I am when a circumstance happens, all of that influences the level and the depth of the woundedness. And even all that stuff, we're going to suspend. We know all those things. What are we going to do with the wound? 1 John 1, 7 says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses all of our sin. If we go on to verse 9, we hear the powerful part for us. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if we're going to have the purity, that intentionality that God has designed for our marriage to win, we've got to get really good at confessing. Mm. We've got to get really good at confessing, not just to God, but to one another. And this, frankly, might sound terrifying. It might, fi- it might be terrifying to bring the things that we've been keeping in the dark into the light, whether they're big things or just little things that have accumulated over time. You know, I work um, part-time in a physical therapy clinic, and in the back of our clinic, we have this little tiny room, and it has a little hallway and a bathroom, and it has some treatment things we use, and it has a refrigerator. And so in other words, we're in and out of there all the time. And normally, it's pretty well lit, and you can see everything you're doing. But a couple months ago, uh, one of the back lights just kind of flickered and went out. And at first, you know, you're really aware of that darkness. I would go into the room, like, kind of struggling to see, find a hot pack or a cold pack, or um, bump into somebody because it's pretty dark in the back half. But over time, even though my mind knew that it was dark, I stopped longing for it to be light. 
because I just kind of got used to it. We, get, we accommodate to it. I know where everything is, and I can get through there, and we stop caring that we're living in a dark situation. Well, last Thursday, I went back to work, and it was like, it was like an eclipse. I mean, it was so bright, it felt ridiculous. But the funny thing is, it was the same normal light that was there before that light ever went dim. So this is what we're talking about. Yes, it might feel like it's okay because you can find a way to live in that dark space. I can live with the junk I'm holding on to or the things I'm carrying. I can live in that darkness, right? We're functioning, we're coping, we're parenting well, I'm keeping a job, we're, we're doing all right. But is that really where we want to be? Because if we want the closeness and the intimacy, then I'm going to have to be willing to let God turn that light back on. I'm going to have to be willing to bring my stuff and to hear your stuff and allow it to come into that light. And yes, at first, it might feel like it is overpowering, that it is too much. But I can promise you that if we are willing to bring our stuff into an arena of forgiveness to restore purity in our marriage in that light, there's true fellowship. Amen. There's unity. There's purity. There's fruitfulness. There's multiplication. And not only is God's design for marriage to win, that we're fruitful and multiply out in the world, it's so that we enjoy each other, that we come back into that place where we, where we remember what it was that caused us to fall in love in the first place, right? Because we forget. We get so clouded up by all this stuff but when we get rid of the barriers and we get back face to face and we have that yeah. purity and that unity again, it's fun. It's not just doing the right thing so we can do all the shoulds. It's so that we can enjoy the gift of marriage that God has given us in one another. So our encouragement this morning is to bring it into the light. But our question is, whose job is it? Whose job is it? to make the first move when you're in that distant spot and to begin to come back together and approach one another to remove these barriers. And the only place we have to look is the best place, which is in the Word. So this morning, we're gonna hear from a few different, different passages, and these passages are not specific to marriage. They are specific to relationship, but in our context, we're gonna speak about them in marriage. And the first passage, if you take notes, I'm gonna encourage you to read it later. It's Matthew 18 verse 15 through 22, and it goes through a very detailed procedural protocol for what do we do when there's hurt and woundedness between us, and we're going to summarize it together today in the context of marriage. So if I am the person that's been wounded, it's my job to go and make the first move. It's my job to go to Tim and say directly to him, not to everyone else, not to post it on Facebook, not to passive aggressively be sure that he knows because I've been ignoring him for 14 days, but to go directly to him. It's also my job not to embarrass, it's to do it privately, not to make sure that my kids hear it because I want them to know that their, their dad has wronged me, right? And we're making light of this, but these are real things that we do when we're not skilled with the tools. So what God is trying to give us is the tools. It's my job to go directly to Tim and to say whatever is going on inside my heart. It's my job to do it in a way that's private and doesn't humiliate or embarrass him or to use um, the onlooking of other people to motivate him to do something. And then the scripture goes on to say that if that doesn't work because the brokenness is so severe, then you go to someone for help. Who do you go to for help? elders in the church, pastor in the church, a life group leader, a godly counselor, and together you take each other before that person and you say, we want healing, but we just can't do it ourselves. That's God's design for what we do with our woundedness. I am the person that has the offense. I'm the one who knows it. Half the time, they don't even know what it is we're hurting about. So I've got to go to him directly and begin that process of healing. But the Lord is not done there. He says, you know who else should go? The person who's done the offense, right? 
the person who's made the offense. In Matthew chapter 5, there's a really beautiful passage about this person who's coming before God in relationship. And in the context of this passage, it's talking about coming to an altar and giving a gift. But all that really means is this person is in desiring relationship with God. So here's this person. Picture yourself. Okay, God, I'm coming to talk to you. I want to have time with you. And God says, I love that you want to come and be with me, but you've got some stuff over here that you need to deal with first. And so here's what it says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 23. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and you're there and you remember that your brother or your husband or your wife has something against you, leave your gift at the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Now, at first we might think this is strange, right? Like, isn't God happy and excited that I'm wanting to foster my relationship with him? Yes, he is. But you know that what he's trying to teach us is that what goes on here affects what goes on here. And he wants your gift of relationship here, but not under the cloak of brokenness that you're not willing to deal with here. So go and deal with this, and then come back, and together, let's worship, and let's relate. Because God cares as much about our vertical relationships with our spouses as he does with our relationship with him. So we've just heard that if you are the one who has been hurt or wounded, we have to go and take steps to reconciliation. But we've also heard that if we're the one that's done the wounding, we have to make the steps to go towards reconciliation. And one final thing that God wants us to know so clearly in our design for marriage to win is that before anybody goes anywhere, that we would come before him. Because in Matthew 7, just a couple chapters later, he gives us another truth that's so critical in relationships of all kinds. And in verse 3 of chapter 7, it says, why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye? I see it in there. Do you? I see it. Why do I see the speck in my brother's eye, but I don't notice this giant log that's poking out of my own? And, and why would I go to Tim and say, let me get that little speck. <laughs> Let me get that little tiny speck out of your eye when I have this giant log. And in verse 5, it says, you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to carefully help remove the speck that's in the other eye. So yes, we need to go when we're wounded, and yes, we need to go when we've done wounding, but the first place we need to go is before God. And if you don't even know what that practically looks like, let me just give you a couple examples. Turn off your music, turn off the phone, sit in a quiet space, inside, outside, somewhere where you can say before God, God, show me why this is bugging me so much. And he will faithfully lead you to see the log, the speck, the situation, the root, the cause, and then with that, you can go. So in order for us to have purity, yes. we have to do these four things. So before we leave, we're going to review them. We're going to introspect. We're going to allow God to examine and to search because we don't want this barrier between us. So we have to know we don't want it, and we have to ask God to show us why it's there. Then we have to go in private, respectfully, carefully, to one another. We have to be willing to confess a hurt or confess a wrong. And then finally, we have to be willing to forgive. Oh. So forgiveness, when it is asked, we have to be ready to give it. And forgiveness, when it's offered, we have to be ready to value it so that we can be restored in our purity one to another. So the whole idea here is a marriage that's fruitful and multiplying, that's full of passion, closeness, and intimacy. The first barrier is purity. It's not the barrier, it's what brings down all the barriers. The second is this, if you're writing notes, take it down, and they're all P's, because I'm a pastor, and that's what pastors poo do. (laughs) Purpose, purpose, everyone say purpose. purpose. Purpose is purposely knowing my role and playing my part. And I just want to ask a question of all the married couples here. Is it possible your marriage is headed nowhere because that's exactly what you've planned for it? You've heard the statement before, hey, uh, if, you, if you fail to prepare, then you're preparing to fail. 
If you don't have any picture, any image of where your marriage is headed, then it's probably headed nowhere or best case, worst case really scenario, you're headed to two different places. It would be like me having a car and Christine having a car instead of having one car together and one car is headed to LA, the other one's headed to New York and you're still married but you're very, very distant from one another. It's hard to have closeness and intimacy when you're separated by the miles and yes, there's Skype and we can have all these pretensions like we're doing fine, but we're really just roommates living in a house, two separate cars. My car's headed down to the video game couch. Your car's headed up to the Lifetime movie couch. I don't watch Lifetime movies. And I don't play video games, except sometimes. Very often. I know what Fortnite is. I know it. I watch the Hallmark channel. Oh, sorry. I watch the ESPN channel. Gator softball. Did you see that? Anyway, okay. Proverbs 29, 18, this is a very famous verse in Christianity, says this, where there is no vision, the people perish. Where the marriage has no concept of where it's going, the marriage is perishing. Or maybe your version of 29, 18 in Proverbs says this, where there's no vision, the people cast off restraint. I know that I came into the, bound, the bonds of marriage in covenant with my wife and with the Lord God. But because we have no vision for where we're going, cast off restraint. I'm going to go over here and do my thing. Woo! I'm going to go over here and do this. I'm going to go over here and do another person. Can I be this, that real? Like, right? That's what happens when there's no vision. We've got no direction that we're headed. I'm going to head one direction and she's going to go another direction. And all of a sudden you've got all this yuck that's happening. And you're like, what's going on? Well, we have no vision. We have no picture of where we're headed. And let me tell you this. Well, first let me tell you how to do this. Uh, to, To get a vision for your marriage, you need to take a dream date. A dream date. Now, you're like, well, man, I can think of my dream date. That's like, let's go play some golf. Then let's go and have some steak fritz. Anyone here a steak fritz fan? Steak fritz is like that steak that's leaking all its juices into the french fries. (laughs) Yes, Lord. (laughs) And she's like feeding me the fries. (laughs) Then we go to Top Golf for dessert and play golf. So it's two golfings. This is, this is my dream date. Yeah, I see. And then we'll go home and do home things, right? Amen? <laughs> Amen? Yeah. So I'm like, what does he mean, home things? Like washing the table? <laughs> you know what I mean. I'm not talking about that dream date. I'm talking about a date to dream. Where you would sit down together and say, where do we want our lives to go? Not our lives. Where do we want our life to go? Because the two have become one. One plus one is one. The two have become one. Where do we want this life to go? How do we want to behave in public? How do we want uh, our kids to see us in our marriage? Do they ever see affection in us? Do they they ever see us taking each other away? How do we want this to go? And here's the key to all of this. If you want a lasting marriage, have a lasting vision. A lasting vision is one that's tied to the eternity of Jesus Christ. It means that both of you have come to the saving knowledge of Jesus. Both of you yoked together said, Lord, we serve you as our Savior. So our marriage is going to serve you as Lord. We're going to be fruitful and multiply, not just in children, but in faith. And so you ask the big question, like, God, what do you want with our marriage? Yes, ask the questions. What do you want to do with your career? Where do you want to be when we retire? Those are good questions, but they're temporary questions. Ask the eternal questions. How do we make an impact on the kingdom with our life? This is the purpose of our life. And as you do that, you yoke together. We're headed in the same direction, headed to do the same things for the glory and honor of the king in Jesus' name, which finally brings us. And when we have that purpose and we match that with the purity where there's no barriers, then we get back to that place of intimacy and passion And in our final defining term of what that passion is, it means purposefully living in your marriage, in the context of your marriage, naked and unashamed. And we're not doing any visual demonstrations on this one. (laughs) So what, what does that mean, that phrase, naked and unashamed? It's truly the definition of intimacy. And where Tim started this morning, talking about Adam and Eve being in the garden and that that triune relationship with God, that was perfect intimacy. They were naked and unashamed. They didn't need clothes. They didn't hide things from each other. And that's what we're talking about here, that God's design for marriage is for us to hold nothing back 
and not just hold nothing back, but to share everything of ourselves, our truest selves, and not feel shame. So what needs to happen in order for that to happen? We as individuals, what we bring to our marriage has to be the work of ourselves, creating a safe space for your spouse to be able to come to you, to be able to live in their truest self. So there's a responsibility on us to be sure that we don't just say, well, you have to be true with me. Yes, but I have to be safe for you. So early on in our marriage, I was not a safe place for Tim. I was emotional. I was over-responsive. I was hyper-angry. And when he tried to bring things to me, I was not a safe space for him to be. So what, what our dance was, and believe me, if you're married or you're in a relationship, you have a dance. Sometimes it's a good one and sometimes it's not. But our dance early on in marriage was, I will hound, I will hound, I will hound, I will hound, I'm bringing this forward, what are you doing, blah, 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 blah. He's hiding, he's hiding, he's hiding, he's hiding. <laughs> he's hiding. And then at the end of the day, why aren't you being honest with me? Because you scare me. Exactly. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> the, the lifetime thing may not have been true, but that was true. So I had to work on being a safe space where he could be his true self, where he could bring fears, where he could bring anxieties. And he had to do the same for me. He had to love me and cover me when I struggled and shared for 20 years, I've been sharing the same kind of struggle about feeling good about who I am. And I'm sure he's sick of hearing it, right? 20 years of hearing or more that I'm insecure about my appearance and my weight and how I look and what I, I mean, he's sick of it, right? In 20 years, he's never once made me feel like he's sick of it. Never one time have I felt that I couldn't come to him and say, I'm still struggling and I need your covering and I need your help. And that's what intimacy is. It's a place to be fully known and to be fully loved. And it doesn't just happen. It doesn't happen just because marriage is natural and God created it doesn't mean that it's easy and everything just happens. It takes intentionality and purpose to remove all those barriers of sin and to be a safe place so that my truest self is safe with the person that I love the most. So if I'm hiding things, if I'm hiding habits, if I'm hiding money that I spend or hurts that I feel, if he's hiding feelings that he has or insecurities or habits or dreams or desires, if we're hiding our truest selves, we're missing the very best gift of marriage. And that is for how God mirrors his unconditional love to us. No, we can't do it perfectly, but we do everything we can with intention to remove all those barriers and we come to a safe space where we can be fully known and fully loved and together with our purpose and our vision, we can go out and we can bear fruit and we can multiply. And along the way, we have a whole lot of fun. Mm. And yes, there's really painful spots, but when we share those really painful spots with somebody that you feel completely safe with, you have the shelter and the cover and the gift of marriage and that is available to every single one of us. Amen. 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 So here's what we want to do today. Two things. Number one, if our encouragers would come forward and just take your spots. As they're coming, I want to tell you what was pivotal for Christine and I in this beginning of our marriage, because we had the honeymoon phase. We were close and intimate and everything, but then we found out that we had this dance where she was, oh, I, I was uh, not willing to, uh, what's the word? Uh, bring up, conflict. Face conflict, right. And she had no problem facing conflict. <laughs> and we were living in this dysfunction with the light off in half of the house, as she explained earlier, and just kind of got used to it. This is how we're going to live just kind of light half off, and now we're just used to the darkness. But somebody invited us to the weekend to remember, years and years and years ago, like 17 years ago, and I thought, what, you know, we got a decent marriage. We're just going to go and listen to a bunch of stuff we already know, 
by a bunch of people who are going to look perfect and make us feel worse about our marriage with a bunch of other people whose marriages are awesome and we're going to be the worst one there. I don't want to go. It's money too. It costs money. Like, I don't, I don't want to want to go. But we went, and I'm telling you, from that day forward, it has revolutionized and so-so marriage into an extremely, incredibly wonderful, not perfect marriage. And the weekend to remember is coming to Orlando. It'll be here the weekend of Father's Day. And I, you're going to miss the beginning of Father's Day if you go. And I'm just telling you, dads, it's worth it for all the rest of your Father's Days to be blessed if you'll miss half of this Father's Day. A weekend to remember usually costs $300 to go per couple. But somebody in our church who's a marriage missionary has decided to pay for 30 couples to go for free. Amen? Go ahead. Get in there. We offered this last week, and 12 couples have already taken 12 of those spots. So there's 18 spots left. But listen, if there's more after that, then I'm going to meet with our executive team and our elders, and we're going to figure out a way that every couple can go to this for free, for at least for the conference part. Let me just make this little logistical side note. There is a hotel fee, and there is food to pay for. And I'm just telling you that now so you don't get sticker shock like we tricked you later. We're going to pay for the $300 fee. If you want to stay at the hotel where the conference is, that's on you. And the, there's, there's stuff that's a part of the weekend, uh, a date night and all this kind of stuff. That would be on you. But we're going to cover the $300 initiation fee if you would for that. Uh, I just want to tell you, just so there's no weirdness later, like, you said it was free. Now I hate you. And our marriage is ruined because of you. Okay, good. <laughs> So I'm inviting you to the weekend to remember. And here's the last thing I'll say about the weekend to remember. It's for marriages that are struggling and marriages that are not struggling. It's for marriages. Amen? So if you're a marriage here, if you're a wedding, if you're whatever here, then it's for you. It's also for people who are considering marriage. And I'm talking like really considering, not like, hey, in seven years, we're going to go to Taiwan and get married. woo -hoo! Now, I just mean that you're sincerely at that place of perhaps getting engaged or you are engaged. You can also go to the weekend to remember you'll need to pay for two hotel rooms, though. Okay. <laughs> Amen. It's in Orlando, right? You do not have to stay at the hotel, but if you're married, it's helpful. All right. Here's the last thing we're going to do today. I just want to invite everyone who's married to come and receive a marriage blessing. And you may think, wow, my marriage is struggling or wow, my marriage is great. It, no matter where your marriage is, you're here today, which deserves credit, which deserves applause. Like congratulations for coming into the place where there's healing and hope for your marriage. And so I'm going to ask you to do something like Jesus did. We sang the song earlier, Reckless Love. We are rec God was recklessly doing whatever he could do to make sure that you knew that he loved you. And for some of you, like, I just refuse to go down front because I'm more. Then people may think I'm messed up or people may think this and people, forget about it. For the sake of your marriage, be reckless for one moment, grab your spouse by the hand, and come down and receive a marriage blessing from our encouragers, who, by the way, encourages, before you leave, bless one another. And before you leave, bless our worship team, because some of their spouses are down here. We just need to make sure everybody that has a marriage is blessed today. Father, in the name of Jesus, send them forth now. If you're married, come now, come now, come now, come now, come now, come now. Come and receive a blessing, God. You love marriage. You instituted it from the very beginning. You called us forth to be fruitful and to multiply in faith and in strength, Lord. May there be purity in our homes. May there be purpose in our marriages. May there be passion returning to all of these married couples. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen.